Hi, welcome to this week's edition of Blue Soccer. I'm John David and myself, and tonight we're joined by our special guest, uh, Peter Bracken, who's from scrumdoctor.com, are going to join us, and we're going to look back over our victory against uh, the Ospreys last weekend, all the other Pro 12 uh, f- uh, fixtures. So, I suppose, first of all, we just want to welcome Peter to the show. Oh, thanks very much, Jason. Um, well, boys, we had a nice victory against the Ospreys last weekend, uh, 31-19 in the RDS. Yeah. yeah, it was a good result. I'm sitting over here on my own. I was bold boy, so I have to sit in the naughty step. Um, yeah, it was it was it was a it was a good result. Um, a good win for Leinster. A great performance against a team that had done well so far this season. I mean, they'd started uh, three for three. Um, it was one of the first times, the first time in the history of the of the Pro 12 that somebody had gone uh, three for three with with three bonus points. So mm-hmm. 15 out of 15 mm-hmm. potential. So to, so to, to hold them to a hold them to nil for so long. And then to hold on for the win and deny them any points was a big, bo- big, big bonus for Lancer, and obviously along with our own bonus point. Yeah, and not only that, the performance. Yeah. The performance was just top Kroger coming at them from all angles from early on. The defence was fairly heroic. The attack was like uh, attack became defence, or sorry, defence became attack very quickly. Uh, where we were turning balls over, we were uh, rushing up at them, and they were just they they hardly had possession. Yeah, yeah, Dave yeah. Carney looked uh, extremely Dave, aggressive in defence. Dave Carney was great in defence. Mm-hmm. Uh, even Noel Reid fronted up very well, and he's been he's had a few shots at him uh, for like, for his uh, soft defense, shoulders. For his soft shoulders, but he was he was up there. And when you consider himself, I know he's twenty six, but himself and Ringrose, who's only mm-hmm. twenty one, are fairly willowy two la- willowy lads in the centre. All the big traffic from Matavisi and fellas like that didn't really make too much of an impression. Uh, and where last week against Edinburgh. We had the line speed and all that, but we didn't have. We were slipping tackles this week. We had the tackles. We had the line speed. The, the the tackle that has to be mentioned is the one on tw- about twenty minutes. <coughs> Issa, when uh, they they made a break, we 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 got turned over on one side. They broke down the other side. Issa came across and absolutely clattered the guy, and it absolutely energized the entire stadium. The entire stadium was up on their feet. Just try scoring. It was try saving. It was a try saving. It was it, it was it was a five point tackle actually. Yeah. Um, and it just completely energised the entire stadium energised the team Michael Cech used to talk about energisers and that was an energiser. Mm. one guy one guy was very impressive was Keane Healy he's coming back to his best yeah. Yeah. Um, as, you, as as Peter would know um, you know there's a bit of strength there now in Leinster uh, at loose head which, between him and uh, Jack McGrath absolutely uh, look it's great to see him back you know and um, you know, obviously, uh, his scrummaging ability, his ball carrying, all that, you know. And uh, now again, um, himself and Jack fight for positions, you know, which is, is so brilliant. Like the, yeah, like the two of them, the two of them uh, fighting together for, for starting places on both the Leinster team and more than likely on the, the Ireland team. So it's, uh, it's great. It's great to see both of them playing so well. The, the, the even more impressive thing is the level below them. Yeah. Um, or, so, it's only nominally below them at this yeah. point. I mean, two guys you'd have an interest in. One, yeah. one a fellow yeah. Offaly man in, in, yeah. in Dooley and a Absolutely. fellow Andrew's boy in, 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 in Mr. Po- uh, Andrew Porter. So Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's a small uh, connection there with both of the guys, you know. And, uh, you know, there's a huge strength and depth there. Um, I think both sides of the scrum, but especially there at Lucet, yeah. you know. And um, with the system in place in Leinster to be able to produce those guys um, on a regular basis, um, it's testament to the, the academy system and, and the school system and guys uh, coming through. And there is an emphasis there now on producing props um, for the last couple of years that mm. may not have been there. You know, so is that by accident or by design, Peter? Well, the, the IRFU uh, set up the scrum, um, elite scrum, uh, panel, I suppose you'd call it, um, about three, four years ago. Um, you know, I, I think at the at the time it was a bit of an overreaction, but like Ireland had a poor one poor scrum performance against England, mm-hmm. therefore five years ago, and yeah, we did yeah. get smashed, but we had smashed them the year before, and we recovered the year after. But you know, I suppose it highlighted um, the need for an emphasis on good scrum coaching and and to be able to produce props uh, regularly and it was something that may up until now just came naturally like we were lucky enough to have you know the likes of John Hayes and uh, Paul Wallace and um, Reggie Corrigan and you know Nick Popperwell all these guys coming through all the time you know so Mm -hmm. we always had uh, decent props but you know it's great to see the strength and depth. 
there now. Is there a danger for Leinster with so many good props? I mean, we're talking, you're talking four front line, and I, I, I'm going to include young Mr. Byrne as the mm. fifth. You're talking about five really top notch loose head props. Is there a danger we're going to, that it, just in order for them to have careers, yeah. some of them are going, to, are going to have to leave? That's, that's my big fear. But I, I don't know if there's anything we can really do about that. Well, it's, it's fairly inevitable, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That they're going to, at least one of them, is going to have to go somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because five into two places are is not going to even if in, admittedly two of them are going to be away with Ireland a lot, but even yeah. at that, you know, three Which people for the remaining places is and th- and those three guys are going to want to have the opportunity to go away with Ireland and to play in the European exactly. matches. So they're going to have to. They may have to 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 go. I can't. I, I can I can see mountains been moved to keep to keep Porter. Yeah, he's he's big swashbuckling yeah. prop. Right? I, I like Peter Doolan. I mean, he's mm. kind of been lost in the in the kind of the, the and, and I mean Andrew Porter's a fantastic player, but Peter Dooley has been lost in the kind of the 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 the, the, the cheering for for. I think he's got he's a fantastic footballer as well, but he's mm. been a very good prop. You know, he might he might actually be a better you know Technical rugby prop. player mm. than, than than Porter at this point. Mm. Although Porter obviously is just a beast, like he is. I mean, he's. <clears throat> but he, the seek on him at nineteen or twenty. He is looks he, like he's mm, already a, you know to him, able yeah. to play at. Uh, is he the uh, Irish Andrew Sheridan? Could be like you know because he was a real power guy. Do you remember? Yeah. Well, you didn't remember him. You probably yeah, played against him a couple of times. Him, yeah, yeah. propped against him. Certainly do remember yeah. him. You know so. You know, he was a, a beast power of a lifter. man. Yeah, yeah. power before lifter. He started, before he started, yeah. yeah. And I think he was competing on, on, on the QT as well while he was playing rugby. <laughs> I, I think uh, Sale... Well, kept that quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, Sale, at the time he was playing with Sale, and uh, um, I think he entered some sort of powerlifting competition. You Bulgarian know. woman, was he? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a couple of days before uh, our premiership game and he won it or something so it came news and they took my side and said you can't do that <laughs> and he said well fine okay um, well I'm going to do it whether so like if you want to fire me or what not <laughs> go ahead so they obviously did uh, you know, yeah they weren't they were going to fire him they were going to fire him yeah, but, or at least they wouldn't yeah. want to be the one to tell him yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah no but he had football in him as well and yeah. you know obviously Andrew has as well and, mm. you know I, 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 I do rate uh, Dooley as well I think he's a very very good yeah. player you know they're, they're all around it um, but yeah it is um, it's a great problem to have oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, for Leinster not necessarily for the guys in concern yeah, though yeah that's true no well I'd agree but I, I, I like there's a lot of good Irish players there there's only four provinces so mm-hmm. You know, there's the English Premiership, there's the French League, there's there are options there. And even if it's only a short term thing, year two or three, you know, I think anyone that has left Irish players, like I had to leave at the time, um, was with Connacht. And, you know, I, I wanted at the time to try and step up to the next level. Um, things have changed now as regards Connacht, like, you know, but it was very, very, very almost impossible to get an Irish cap if you were playing with Connacht at the time and uh, I ended up going over to England and I think you know I played probably my best rugby over there and that was the, the peak of my career things then took a bit of a, a bad turn and whatnot. Uh, but um, there are options open there for mm. the young guys but for, <laughs> that's no good to Leinster obviously Leinster would like to keep four guys but they're going to get stale and that's where I think the AIL is such a brilliant, brilliant competition. Mm. I don't, personally, it's only my opinion, really see the relevance of the BNI Cup. You know, I don't think, I, I think if you're, like, back in the, the days, uh, you know, if you, if you weren't making the provincial first team, you go back and play your with your club and you'd have an affiliation with mm. that and you'd be playing with your friends and guys you played up with. Um, so, you know, uh, to have the likes of those guys playing weekend well with with a club, even I heard uh, a mention of you know maybe a semi professional uh, type of thing. But you know the top ten t- AIL teams in Ireland mm. are excellent level, and, mm. and those guys should be playing weekend week out. A couple of years ago, I'd have, I'd have argued with you mm. um, because there's there seemed to be kind of the AIL seemed to be going down this route where it, there were there were a couple of guys who were kind of I don't want to use the phrase club owners, but were had control of clubs and they were trying to position the clubs as opposition certainly in Limerick they were mm-hmm. trying to posi- position the clubs as opposition to the provinces there were guys who were you know been paid good money to play with clubs and not take development co- pro- uh, contracts with the provinces there was one player in particular we, who we both know who, who, who did that but 
since that has faded away, there are guys, the AIL, which a lot of younger players, the average age of the AIL must have come down five years mm-hmm. in the last three years, you know? Mm-hmm. And the standard of rugby being played is excellent. And then you see, yeah, you see, you see how well Ireland, have, you see how well, say, Leinster have done the British and Irish Cup. And you see guys who, who've looked like absolute monsters in the British and Irish Cup, then not really been able to get to the next level. I'm thinking about guys like, say, Sam Coughlin Murray, I'm talking about guys like Darren Hudson, maybe others who weren't able, who, who looked like absolute earth shattering in the British and Irish Club, Cup but weren't able, maybe the level of the British and Irish Cup actually isn't as good as we thought it was mm. maybe those guys would be better off playing it, uh, in the AIL you see, the, you see what it's done for the likes of Joey Carberry yeah, yeah. you see, you see the, the, the guys the props coming through you see Ross Maloney coming through mm. um so maybe maybe we have maybe that is a better route yeah. to go. No, uh, maybe like like because I played in the second team competition a uh, couple of games with my time and watched that something similar over in England. No one wanted to play in those games. It was an absolute nightmare. A league or something. A league was the A league. It's the same as the British and Ireland uh, Irish Cup. No one wants to play as a player. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you have to be resilient and. Uh, play a oh, big pro and all that but deep down no one wants to bother their backside to go out and play British and Irish mm. BS but do you think, they, I think say, but just, just say the AIL right mm. if they restructured it like for years and now obviously say they got they brought in the AIL in the late 80s mm-hmm. and they kind of semi-created rivalries that really weren't there like there was no rivalry between say Lansdowne and Cork on as such mm. the, rivalry, yeah. the rivalry was between Lansdowne and Wanderers or yes. do you know what I mean yes and as a result like I remember being just happened to be down in, in Middleton and they were playing City of Derry and that's probably you couldn't get two further Sorry. points in yeah. the country from each other mm. now there was a handful of fellas came down from City of Derry you know probably a busload but like they made nearly a weekend of it down there yeah. there was hardly any interest so there was probably more mm. away supporters than there was yeah. um, you know mums and dads at the matches than there was fellas from or supporters from Middleton because they're kind of those two teams never played each other they had no history of playing yeah. each other so if they kind of had some sort of I agree with totally what you're saying about you know reinvigor the amateur or the semi-professional leagues but have it on, on a provincial basis mm. and then perhaps or even mm. a, a conference situation where it's based in each province so that there is a rivalry Mary's tearing your you yeah. know Dolphin Con or you Shannon can probably, you can probably Sh- do something in, in terms of Leinster Munster mm. And then Connacht and Ulster. Yeah. Mm. Or you could split city. You could do it like they have in the Provincial Towns Cup. You could have a metropolitan. Co- you could have the metropolitan conference and a and a and a provincial conference. Yes. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, I, I used to. What I used to like about the BNI Cup was the fact that it pitched really fit young academy guys against wizened old characters from the the yeah, uh, yeah. either Ponty Creed mm. or maybe some of the championship sides in England. I thought it was a very interesting. Clash Do you remember John Wells to, yeah. at the age of forty playing in the British yeah. and Irish Cup? But it's, it's, to, to say that, but I'm, I'm not yeah. necessarily disagreeing with you. I just, mm. I, I also think that uh, the Welsh want to get something, or keep something going to have a British mm. and Irish thing going at any level whatsoever. They've put their regional teams into it. They've taken the likes of Ponty Breed and, and all out of the mm. competition last year, and they put in their like. The Scarlet's B team, the, the Cardiff B team, the, all of this. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. there are a couple of things that, that there are a couple of interests that might want to keep it going. The championship clubs don't give a rat's ass no. about it, I don't yeah. think. I don't they, think they're they do. too busy fighting. Oh, they've too many games. <laughs> and like you just said, the, the, the Scarlet's B teams, and, you know, these yeah. guys are not, you know, at least if you put someone like Ponty Breed in it, they're, gonna, mm. they're an actual club. Yeah. yeah. And even with us, with our academies, you know, there's there's something there. We're like we won it twi- two years in a row, mm. and there there was some pride in it. You know, it was because all of the guys in it are are very young. It might be two or three guys over twenty five, and and everybody else <coughs> was an academy guy. So, you know, but I t- totally agree that if you could get the the more players that get kind of pushed down into the AIL, the stronger the AIL gets. Yeah. The, yeah. you know, becomes because the rising depth, tide that lifts all exactly. boats. Yeah. The depth yeah. is now there, and yeah. like you're saying there about is, the yeah. props and all that. Mm. So if that spreads, in, unfortunately now it's concentrated on your UCD, Clontarf, Lansdowne. You know, there's mm. there are a few teams who have the whole of the bloody Leicester Academy between them. Uh, if it was spread around a bit more, maybe 
there might be a the one the one thing to note is anyone who's seen the last we'd say three <coughs> AIL finals well, yeah. uh, what great matches no, yeah. games, they've been great games you know and yeah. like uh, you would you watch the try highlights on on a Friday or yeah. on a Saturday they're brilliant yeah right? yeah Oh yeah, the, the, some of the some of the tries yeah. been scored in the AIL this oh, year, or, or the last two years, are just fantastic. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's 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 something that needs support. Um, the question is, obviously, with Ireland's pyramid structure, with everything been focused up on the top, mm-hmm. does widening that level of the base rather than keeping things pointing up mm-hmm. is that strategic enough? That's the question, I suppose. But you have to give the base oh, yeah. an opportunity. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just, you know, for years we had two cent- you know, two Irish centres, two of the best. Centres in the world. It was just massive blockage that anyone who wanted to aspire to play at a very high level, like you know, if we move on from in, from provincial, either you know they were blocked by O'Driscoll and Darcy, and they had to go away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I I think that uh, if if you're saying the pyramid structure, what's happening though is the per- it's been forced down. Yeah, yeah. The, the players yeah. the players are queuing up so much to get into the provinces mm. that they're having to play. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's like mm. the, the the roadblock or the the glut of players that are developing through the school system. You know, if they're not playing for Leicester, or if they want to aspire to play for Leicester, they have to go and play for Mary. We we're talking about the glut of players at a prop, but like the back the back row is also oh, yeah. like I mean, and Van de Fleer at the weekend, you know, he had a storming he match. Like immense. we just look at, I think Dave's going to get his try up now, but you know he which one? Well. Just his, like he just looked like a young Sean O'Brien to me in that game. I mean, it starts off well actually. It's nice, it, it's nice line out. Yeah. We ma- we started mauling this year. Yeah. We've been very, Good. we've had a very fairly definitely. poor maul last last two years, mm-hmm. but this year now it's it's got much much better. I nearly got over the line here. Yeah. yeah. It's much tighter. There's good control there. Yeah. Is this something that you'd? Be uh, in, involved in coaching as well, Peter, because it's kind of they used to call it the loose scrum. The loose scrum, yeah, yeah. Oh no, I uh, have no problem coaching. Them all, <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, ah, yeah, would you know? We do go around scrum coaching primarily, but like while I'm at a club, I'm open. Whatever a club, they need to. It's just good usage as well. There's no, no. nobody panicking there. No. He yeah, pops yeah. off to him. Yeah. Look at him, he had two second rows yeah. to deal with there, I think. Well. Yeah. Six and a second row, I think. And good intelligence to get the ball down <laughs> on the line <laughs> as well. Yeah. yeah. It's only when you get the back view and you see his you know, poking through to ground the ball. Two guys tackling one. I think that's James two. King. Yeah. yeah. And then the other. a little bit of a help there, Keen, is it? Yeah, Keen, yeah, Keen, yeah. Keen latches on. Still. Just that. Come on. I see it there. Yeah. yeah. Matt of is not exactly a shrinking violet in the no. power stakes either. He, he does well to get the ball down, I think. Well. Yeah. Just he's watching him, it just reminded me of a <coughs> very young O'Brien, maybe going back five or six years ago. Yeah. What? Do you know who he reminds me of? He reminds me of Keith Leeson. Mm. That's ah, who he reminds yeah, me of. Yeah. Be the same type of stature. Yeah. Right he has Sean O'Brien's handoff, though. He does, yeah, that kind of atomic powered handoff. Mm. It was great, though, that Keen. It was at the back of the rock there because how many tries has Keane scored from that distance? Yeah. So the boys were drawn into him and, and he gives he the pop. Like yeah. If I was marking there, I'd be thinking, there's no way Keane is go, uh, he's going to take it. So I'm going to get low and try and take Keane out. And then all of a sudden, he pops it off. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Pretty intelligent. There was lots of good play. I mean, Keane Healy, big carry there again. Mm-hmm. One of his better games for Leinster, Zane Kirshner. Zane Kirshner. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. Much criticised. He kind of blows hot and cold. Yeah, that's the problem with him, I think. I mean, he's just as liable to go out and have a stinker next week. But Johnny definitely made a big difference. Yeah. Like you can just see to the come back to it as well as he did. Yeah. I mean, whatever about the try there, but just the way he ran the game, yeah. he was constantly on, right on the line, and he was, you know, he was leading into it and offloading either side and mm-hmm. to forwards, backs. You know, he just. He just ran the show. He pulled the strings as the, the old cliche guy. I thought he did very well. I thought McGrath's try was a try. I thought he kind of he <coughs> went to ground and posted the ball behind yeah, it. Yeah, I thought that was very, it was very clever. Whether yeah. he got away with it or not, it was clever play, I thought. I don't think he dropped it. I think he no. actually meant to post it. He, he was done for, uh, for a knock-on. Yeah, 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 but I don't think it was a knock-on. I, 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 think, I, think, I think he rolled it back. 
Went of easy again. <laughs> Didn't have a great game, did he? No. Oh. <clears throat> you know, when, when Man of Easy and, you know, uh, K- uh, Reed are the two opposing dwells, and Man of Easy is the one who's gone around disgruntled and, you know, starting fights. No, that's it. That, that's a good sign, you know, because no. Man of Easy is probably about three or four stone heavier than Reed. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. Um, and didn't really make use of that to a huge degree. So. Next one, next one is, is, is porn for Peter. <laughs> Uh, they got um, they had a man in the bin. Yeah, they had their first choice. Uh, so they yeah. had a winger on the. Yeah, that's Matt Avesi on, Matt on the flank. Yeah, uh, the twelve yeah. On, the, on the flank. That's good. Yeah, go for it when they're down. And then they had the man <laughs> trying to come in from the side before the scrum, so straight under the posts. Yeah. <coughs> and fair enough, it was the third scrum as well. Mm. So, you know. it just shows. I mean, some people will tell you that flankers push doesn't matter. It just it just shows you. I mean, how many times do you see it? I mean, you've, uh, Matt Avesi is not a small man, mm. and he's not a weak man. He doesn't no. have the technique. No. But he doesn't have the technique. No. It shows you. Do you remember Dougie Howe was on the wing for Munster? Oh. Anisa. Anisa, yeah. Anisa, yeah. yeah. But uh, Anisa ended up by. But those are those are side of our scrum yeah. this week. Yeah. Jamie's a great footballer at the back of a scrum, so yeah. he is. His control is always excellent. Yeah. Well, you you see there. That's where I'm going with now, and a lot of my coaching as well is. Like obviously the hit is almost gone out, but you can see there there is a hit. It's just mm, like yeah. shorter, so the short distance you have to be more explosive. Be more explosive, or just still get the hit, but you're not going to be able to push. Like back when I was playing, you'd hit and keep going, whoever owned the hit. Yeah, so that's gone. So you have to be able to hit and then control it. Mm. So like what I teach now is rather than going to push a team, lock it down, hold the pressure. And then when something gives, ramp, uh, it, up. ramp it up yeah. and then just go for it. Just look for the opportunity, isn't it? Look for the opportunity, yeah. Yeah. go for it. Because, you know, you can keep the ball in there for as long as you want. And uh, something's going to give at some stage. And that's what Leinster did. Now, they were weakened and whatnot. It didn't take them too long. So they just went in, hit, got got settled. And then um, it was an adjustment. I think a hip went out or something from the thing. And then Leinster walked it. And once you get walking... Yeah, it's, really, it's almost impossible to stop. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, they seem to have um, like there's a lot of I mean, the BBC particularly. They mm-hmm. put the scrum clocks on. Oh, you know, there seems uh, to be there's anti anti scrums, yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah, one yeah, of the yeah. things that makes the sport yeah unique and, yeah. and and different from others that yeah. you have a, a, an opportunity to have a scrum in it. Absolutely. And then you have you got you've got sixteen fellas in a slot. A small mm. area. Yeah. So therefore, there's going to be a lot of space elsewhere. Absolutely. I was watching. Yeah. I was watching. So, it. so oh, opportunity to. Yeah. It's the best atta- attacking opportunity you have. You know, if you've mm. got solid scrum and there's so much you can do off it. Like ask any back, they'll love to run off a scrum. There's that distance between the opposition. But um, yeah, look, it, it is the defining difference between rugby and. You know, if you asked a child to draw rugby match, to draw a scrum, probably yeah. you know, and um, <clears throat> that doesn't help with this uh, this kind of crack. No, yeah. Yeah. look, not yeah, everyone's not like us. No, we don't want to be watching. Yeah. Sc- not everyone's no. resets. Scrum, <laughs> yeah, 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 I, 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 I was watching a top fourteen game. Yeah, top fourteen. Yeah. Uh, but it was brilliant. I think it was. I think it might have been <laughs> Rassing <laughs> against. Going at it rather than resetting <laughs> See, on, I think. I think it was Rassing yeah. against Toulon, and yeah. the ball went in. The ball went in straight, unusually. Yeah. And yet both eights yeah. pushing so hard and so equally. Both hookers were afraid to take a foot off yeah. the ground. Yeah. So you had the two scrum. You could actually yeah. see the ground kind of chund- chundering. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, the ball was just sitting there. there. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was like 35 seconds, yeah, was, 40 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Yeah. And the pressure. And the pr- and immense pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Just but neither of them could take the... It, the moment one of them took a foot off the ground to get their hook on, Shh. it was yeah. gone. And that's what happened. One of them just decided he'd take a... Re- Maybe he thought he felt a, a, a lessening of the pressure. Yeah. Yeah. He took... Uh, yeah. The, the yeah. Rassing... Uh, Swarzewski took his foot off the ground. Yeah. And they just went backwards. Mm. It was just unbelievable. It was the yeah. most amazing scrum I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh, like that's brilliant. Yeah, and that's that's why hookers should be hooking. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, hook the ball, hold hold that initial shove. When you know, like if you're in opposition, you're uh, as soon as it, on the strike is the best opportunity because yep. the, the hooker's hooking. But you can hold more pressure than you can exert. So any team on their own ball should be able to hold that pressure. Hook, get it back to the eight. And hold it 
in the eight for 30 seconds if you want, if mm. you so wish. But get the ball back to the back and then every option is open. Where if mm. it's stuck in the middle, uh, it becomes a 50-50 then. You know. Also, you decide if it's at your eight feet. You yeah. decide what you're doing. What you're doing. Scrum half could hit him on the yards and run. Yeah, and that, you know, and he could take it straight out, yeah. straight to the end. Peter Stringer, like there's none of that. Half, he could, you know. There's guys well, like, like you said, you have all the options. Yeah. There's guys like yeah. Sean Cronin, like yeah. when they changed the regulation, like they, when they got yeah. rid of the hit. Yes, and he did and, struggle. And, and, yeah. Yeah. But I, I think that's because you had a whole generation of <coughs> even international standard hookers well, they, they who are required to hook for the first, first time, time in their entire yeah. rugby yeah. playing lives. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, and, and and you've had to look back then to the older generation. Like, yeah, uh, you, you, you know, to I've talked to guys basically in their sixties, seventies about hooking to try and go back to because you, you, someone my age pretty much has never hooked. Mm. So you know, and uh, so hooking has gone back to the old style of actually hooking, hooking and getting your hips around, and be able to hook. The guys, you just, think that the the. Um, the physical size of mm. the players has kind of changed. Like, mm. you know, back say, you're t- I'm talking about, you know, fellas that might be in their fifties now. Yeah. If they played prop, they were always a big lad, but the hooker was slightly smaller. Yes. Than the hooker whereas was hanging off. He was, yeah. yeah. Whereas, yeah. Like yeah. That. see, yeah. nowadays the hooker wouldn't yeah. be too dissimilar. No. In physical size yeah. than, than the prop. So back then they were the same size as scrum halves. Yeah. So maybe they have to go back to a smaller yeah. hand, or yeah. you know. Um, well, I think I think a lot of it's down to flexibility as well, mm. and um, you get your hips around. You get your hips around if you're flexible enough, and to be able to point your hips in a direction that you can hook. See, a lot of hookers can't hook because. It's, I, I, it's not so much that they're too big to hook; it's that their hips are square and they're they're scrummaging like a prop because they don't know anything else. Yeah. Okay, so you need to even big or small. You need to hook like a hooker. So you know if your hips are straight, you, it, it's it's anyone, no matter how big or small you are, you're not going to be able to get your hips around. So you have to turn your hips in such a way to be able to hook, and then you can come back once the ball is hooked. Then you can bring the hips in line again and scrum in straight as a prop if you want to really do that you know? the, the Argentinians had a huge effect on the modern scrum didn't they with their yeah. three man and their baraja shoves oh, did B- Bege- what is it Bejado where they no they've all, they, they basically the entire power of the scrum Bahada, going through Bahada, Bahada, Bahada. yeah Bahada. going through the through the hooker as, okay, a, as a kind yeah. of a, a, an arrowhead on a wedge and they all yeah. used the, yeah. Yeah. the outside yeah, so. foot to, to drive off so it was basically the scrum was going in yeah. in and up and straight yeah. into the that, that, I think that had a huge effect they on started it they started oh, yeah. the yeah. no hook do you remember they yeah. Yeah. We, it was a really windy day in Lansdowne Road and they kicked the ball dead that was so, Italy was that, Italy? that was Italy in well, 16 they gave a huge influence yeah. Just from the Argentinians just, just, just to get the scrum the initial yeah. that's right yeah. but that was that against Ireland that was against Ireland and we locked it out we locked day. it out yeah. And, yeah. and we had a great scrum yeah. and we had a yeah. great scrum for the whole day yeah, that's yeah I, remember I remember that, that yeah. it was a mass. I remember that's right We, myself and my dad were up in the top of the east stand yeah. and the stewards had tied themselves <laughs> you know where the, with the barrier where, the, where, the, where you came out into mm. the stand the stewards had tied themselves with their Irish scarves to the thing it was that windy yeah I remember that day very well and they just kicked it dead straight to try yeah, yeah. I remember no, I, I remember that uh, really, really well because I think the Argentinians were talking up during the week that they were going to attack John Hayes and whatnot mm. that they weren't didn't rate him or whatnot, and so they kicked off so they get back so they could attack him and John absolutely locked it out. It was, it and was, he had a brilliant game. It was funny, but he wasn't he wasn't the most technical of props. Oh, right. But whenever anyone said oh, we're going to attack John Hayes, oh, well, John Hayes always went go yeah, for it. Yeah, go for it. That's <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah, he always stood up to it. Absolutely, yeah. He had the look of a man that you could hit with a shovel, and he just look at you and go, "Yeah, <laughs> a fly." Yeah, yeah. I don't do that again. Now I'll, I'll hit you back. It was oh, your nemesis for for a good few years. Ah, or? not at all. No, we just probably he was the guy ahead of me. We'd say and possession he, of the jersey. He, he possession and the jersey, and you know, like. Um, uh, you know, he was a he he he, he was a brilliant. Player, you know, such long, long jersey, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, huge long career. And he yeah. never got injured, but unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, so I didn't, I didn't get a chance. He must have played more than 150, 200 times for Munster, yeah. over 100 times for Ireland yeah. in that position. Yeah, you know, not like yeah. one of the lads out in the backs. Where yeah, do yeah. your hair for half the game. Do your yeah. hair. Well, he couldn't do his hair, <laughs> and he pretty much played every minute. You know, every, every, minute, every minute. Yeah, and, and and got better as well. Like it's like all props, you know, the older you get. The better you get, you know. Mm. Um, Look at Mike Ross. Yeah, 
Yeah. Absolutely. The position has changed. Though. Certainly on, on the tight head. Yeah. Tight head used to be there used to the pro, there used to be a real it used to be a real power position. Mm. And now you look at guys like almost the ideal prop now. The modern prop is Marty Moore. Mm. In terms of that size, yeah. he's he's smaller. Mm. He's more he's more sneaky. It's a mm. sneakier position than a. Uh, definitely yes. I think I played in the probably the ultimate era of the power smash mm. scrum. And if you're really explosive and smashed, you could win a, a scrum. And if you had some sort of half decent technique, you were good. But without good technique, now you're, yeah. you're going to struggle. Now, there's the argument: what size? What's the perfect? Yeah, probably it likes a Marty. He saw. He's such a big frame. He's as wide as a house, but he's low to the ground. Mm. Boom. Yeah, he's going to be hard to move, get low. But, you know, I know he's retired now, but you look at Carl Heyman, he's probably the best prop ever. Tie head. What, 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 happened, what happened to his, his lifting four, record in Wasps? Oh, that was beaten what happened, by what happened to someone him? in this on, on, his, on his first day, on his first day in first the... Day of that, yeah, wasn't yeah. That, that was Craig Dowd, actually. Yeah. Oh, Craig Dowd, wasn't Dowdy, it? Dowdy, yeah. yeah. sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alright, I don't think he watches it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, well, you know, you have to make an impression yeah. on your first day with the European champions. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know, that was funny. Like, I, I decided, right. Well, look, it, well, see, that was the great. Was at the time were at the top of the tree, okay? And I couldn't start a game for Connacht for love nor money. But at the same time, Warren Gatland rang me to see would I come over and play with the European champions. So there wasn't much thinking about that. But, um, you know, you got there and there was this kind had of... He, sorry, had he coached you before he was He had, you? no, I'd, I'd missed him a few times because he had coached um, Connacht. And I was kind of coming on the scene, I was playing with all regions and whatnot. And uh, he got the Irish job and then I got into Connacht and Steph Nell was our coach there. And he uh, coached me for two years or so so I missed Warren Warren was the Irish coach at that time uh, but then uh, Michael Bradley came in to coach Connacht and uh, things went downhill for me as regards getting game time um, but obviously Gatlin was keeping an eye on me he was over at Wasps and whatnot. so yeah he rang me to um, during my second season wondering why I wasn't playing and what was wrong with me and uh, what not and I said was I injured or what not so I kind of had to explain that no I was <laughs> perfectly fine it's just that I wasn't starting too many games and so yeah so he um, he did tell me at the time he was looking that he was going to be moving on into international coaching so but would I still come over so I said yeah absolutely so I ended over there but he got the Welsh job and then Ian McGeechan took over so it was Geech that coached me at Wasps and Craig Dowd we played his last season with Wasps and he took over as forwards coach. So I kind of came in to, I suppose, replace uh, Craig. Uh, Craig and um, But at the time, it just goes to, to show the like the strength and conditioning and all that side of the game over in here in Ireland because Wasps were European champions and they had a reputation that, you know, they were the fittest and the strongest team in Europe at the time, which they probably were. So I was kind of thinking to myself, bloody hell, I'm going to have to make some sort of impression over here but I got there and I suppose yeah I was always naturally strong fair enough but the condition we had done in, in Connacht was, was excellent so yeah I came over and you know I started deadlifting breaking records doing that and that was that was a great way in and it gave me a bit of a, a kind of um, yeah that I'm up kudos. to uh, kudos are up to that the fans go oh wow yeah oh yeah. wow oh wow yeah. and that's all it did oh yeah. wow Great. So, which so it put me on the radar. But like uh, d uh, being a good de deadlift de yeah. uh, doesn't make you uh, brilliant rugby player. Unless there's you know? a sudden need to deadlift the opposition. Yeah, the opposition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'd want to be wary of guys. You know, like there is a lot of that. Oh, you Well, if you're playing you. Dylan Hartley, you'd be tempted. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's the extended neck. Remember when he played for Northampton and that finally, whatever he was able to do with, with Tonga Wea and uh, the other lad, um, Majati, yeah. he was able to get his neck up out of the way and Majati could get in underneath him and drive the And they were doing it all year in the Premiership. Mm. And it was only worked out at half time in the final by, by uh, a Greg combination Feek, of, was of, of Greg Feek, Feek and Mike Ross. Ross yeah. what, whatever yeah. the secret was, I'm not entirely sure, but. Yeah. Uh, 
There was one scrum on the twenty two where the whole game just changed yeah. and that's I, I remember I remember that scrum. That was the scrum we got we won a penalty off it. Yep. Yeah. And that Johnny converted and that took us into the lead for the first time in that yeah. match. And I remember just losing my shit. Yeah, quite that's frankly. Exactly <laughs> what happened. I was right behind the goal where that was kicked and in the first half they had Mujati in the bin. And they were still pushing us. Yeah, they were, yeah, yeah. Like seven guys. Yeah. But it just couldn't work out what it was. Well, they were, they were, they were, but it was a technical cheat. Maybe you know more about it, I don't know. But yeah. Like, Mijati Mijati and Tonga Wee as a partnership yeah, were, were absolutely good, yeah. superb for yeah. North Hampton. They really were. Yeah. They, just, yeah. they dominated but English English rugby in an encouraging perspective they, anyway. Do you remember they, the Premiership that yeah. year that they were literally driving fellas they were, 30 yeah, yeah. yards up the park? It was comedy stuff at They were doing that to Leinster in the first half. But you have to admire like the coaching staff but also Cullen as well mm. for kind of getting in in the ref's ear mm. oh, yeah, and, yeah. and you know reiterating with him look what they're doing it's illegal you, yeah. have, to, you have to keep an eye out for it you know mm. what I mean and, just re- and he wasn't doing it in an aggressive way he mm. was just reminding look our scrum isn't this bad mm. and you, you know you, you have to keep an eye on it yeah yeah because Leinster had an excellent scrum um, them years and it was the first time they were in trouble mm. all year but the boys went off script as well at the start of that game they they weren't scrummaging as they did in every other game before that. So there was a few things happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was going on, but they would have known that was going to happen going in and they would have had planned for it, but they didn't execute their plan. And basically, what I've heard is uh, is that, uh, yeah, Fiki realised what was going on. The guys pretty much realised, look, uh, we... Bring it back to we basics. We haven't done what we have done all year. What are we doing? And they just went back to what they've always done and they had no problems. You know, and if there was ever a game that won or lost a game, like that was a game of two scrums or two halves because, mm. you know, uh, Northampton dominated the first half and were dominating the game. Leinster came out, sorted everything, dominated the second half. Well, it, it's funny actually, it's, it's funny, a game of scrums, Leo Cullen's autobiography actually is. That's right, It's structured. From scrum oh, really? to scrum oh, really? in that oh, match, it's right. structured oh. around the scrums, yeah. which is, which yeah. were they they were the key features of that game. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's funny when you talk about a Leinster game, and it was a glorious running game, but that match is a match of it's it, the story of that game is the story of scrums. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's yeah. Amazing. And it's like just, there's only eight or ten of them per game. So yeah, like yeah. It just goes it's to so show important. how important that there's eight, eight scrums. But are. the fact that they could come in and realise straight away that we've caused this. I, I, we know what's wrong and we know how to fix it and we're able to know that and actually just go and do it that's why every team should have a good consultant scrum coach like oh yeah absolutely <laughs> a good one actually, there's, a, there's a question for you yeah. actually um, I mean the last well two out of the last three Leinster scrum coaches have been scrum have been consultants actually okay, Greg yeah. Fee came over as a consultant oh, right, Mario Caputo came over as a consultant you're he you're a, going well. huh? yeah, he had us going well he ha- I tell you I tell you yeah. I, I mean he was the success of that little period of time his, his scrum was a, was a good scrum yeah um, you're a consultant scrum coach is that is it coming to a situation where that level of the level of spe- specialisation yeah. required for scrummaging is such that a team can't carry a full one and they have to go for consultants or is it is it yeah. just adding a, 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 giving a little bit of extra help at that level yeah well I, I think well I would say this because you know but I think it's such a technical area mm. the game it's a full time job you yeah. know being in part of a a, te- a professional setup that want to win uh, trophies uh, you have to have a full time person mm-hmm. I think dedicated to the scrum and you know because it's not just your scrum it's the opposition yeah and what not there's so much uh, going on there so whether you have a full time coach or a consultant uh, it has to be a specialist I, 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 yeah absolutely um, no yeah it would be great to have a forest coach who happens to be a former proper former second row and, and is a scrum nose as well and then you turn your scrum coach into a forest coach but you know if, if your forest coach isn't an expert you need an expert in the scrum yeah. really professional team oh you do and you know and uh, well of course I'm going to say this as well at every level of the game if you can get someone in at least to um, um, show the ropes or improve I, I remember I mean you, you, you've been doing some work with Kuma and Rugby Club which is our old club 
Um, but I remember uh, about five or six years ago uh, when Bernard Jackman was coaching them. Right. Yeah. He brought in Stan Wright. Oh, that's mm. right. yeah. To help yeah. with with that with that generation. Yeah. And that entire every single team in Cool Mine went unbeaten that season. Really? Yeah. Really? Every yeah. single team. Every single in team the club. in the club went unbeaten. Like from underage, all, all the way up, up all the way up to the top. Went unbeaten. Three games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all within the club. Uh, I mean, it was. It, uh, but uh, apparently, like Stan, for all his foibles, and we we we've, we've spoken to him. We know what he's like. Apparently, he was a like he was a brilliant scrum yeah, coach. Apparently, yeah, he was really yeah. really good. And he went with did worked on with all the teams. Yeah. Oh, well, that's the perfect scenario yeah. that you go in and work with all the teams. Yeah. And I suppose that's one reason why I've developed my scrum and our my scrum coaching course that you can go into a club and you coach. Well, ideally, that there'd be at least one coach on every team that's able to coach the scrum first of all in a safe manner mm -hmm. but then in an efficient and a performing manner but like you do go around and I do get a shock uh, more often than not of the lack of knowledge of the scrum and the fact that a scrum especially at underage is either completely ignored because with all the best will in the world th th there's no one involved in the team that knows anything about scrummage. So rather than teach guys the wrong thing, they just completely ignore it and hope nothing too serious happens. Do you, at the you weekend. find you know the rule where the scrum can't go back a meter? <coughs> yeah. Do you think that's a good or a bad idea? Is that an age grade rule? An age grade rule. Yeah. 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 I think it's a bad idea, but I can see why yeah. it's there. Because I read somewhere that the well, the two countries that were most uh, um, that sort of implemented it the most amongst the underage teams was Ireland and Australia and the two team two countries at world rugby level who scrum now obviously things have started to change in Ireland now mm. with the amount of props coming through but we never traditionally had a you know an intimidating scrum mm. um, and neither did Australia you know it was kind of a, an opportunity to, to, to attack Australia as true to scrum and I'm just wondering like was, was it related to you know the scrum not that kids are get to 18 and they actually haven't had a proper yeah contest, contest yeah, yeah yeah no well uh, at now like if you, you like i always hear guys telling stories about the uh, leinster senior cup that some teams because they know that um uh they don't have to scrummage that can go into a scrum walk backwards a meter and a half once they have to hook the ball they can walk back then and throw it out so that means you can put five flankers or eight flankers on the team and yeah. you know your best footballers and whatnot and and even if you do have a prop and he's going up um i think it's actually more dangerous having that rule because what happens in later life so you've you're playing schools rugby or you're playing under 18s rugby and you've never had to scrummage properly because if you were in trouble you just walk backwards and everything was there to protect you okay and then you turn 19 and your first game is against a 35 year old grizzly prop who only wants to scrummage and and kill you okay oh, so you play Tullow then yeah Tullow you go down to Tullow you go down to Tullow and the boy and you you know it's absolutely dangerous because you don't know how to protect yourself so like at least even if you have proper coaching and you've had a contest <clears throat> at least you'll be in a safe position now there's always that well at any position in the game but if you're a front row there is that learning curve when you go into adult rugby you know you're going to struggle mm. for a few years but at least you're going to go backwards or be under pressure in the scrum but be be safe You'd have picked up a few tricks You'd along the way. You'd picked up uh, a few tricks on the way, exactly. And you know how to tell your second row to punch the opposing hooker. Well, if it comes down, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Without <laughs> using racially aggravated <laughs> language. <laughs> <laughs> but what I think a better idea is to be able to ref the scrum properly. And like, does, does that frustrate you when you when you're watching the match on the telly mm. and you see mm. a ref and it's almost like. He puts his arm one way yeah. to the first scrum and his arm the other way sort of to yeah. even it up for the second scrum yeah. and you're going, what the hell is he What's doing? That? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't frustrate me because I can see, I can see it from a referee's point of view that how can any, like, that's all I do. I'm pretty much a, a scrum coach. I do scrums every day and sometimes I get it wrong. So how... On you. And you can con some guy who used to play scrum half. Yeah, yeah. So how how is he We're supposed on the wing. to know everything? 
you know um, and he and that's only one part of the game for 15 seconds that he has to he has to go and he's looking at breakdowns and and whatnot but I think uh, they cut up their knowledge at the same time you know um, but it, it's it's such a hard job it's it's, it's hard to know and, and guys it's it, it, things like to be able to spot the difference between a, a tight head prop boring in on purpose because he's boring in or that he's going in sideways boring because the loose head is forcing him in that way mm. I can spot that in most cases but like it's very hard to expect a guy who's never played in that position um, to spot it and get it right all the time but at the flip side I did a bit of a kind of survey just my own kind of thing um, last year and I watched it was last year Six Nations or was it the year before and I went through every scrum and I said every penalty and see which calls were right or wrong and basically 50% of the calls were wrong they should have went to the other team so what I'm saying is if you got a monkey flip a coin. to flip a coin <laughs> you would get as good a return no, and no. is that no talk about Peter Fitzgibbon <laughs> that's not fair you know <laughs> but, but I think you're better you know like a referee at school's level let the guys compete and, and, and push as much as they like but you should know when to blow the whistle that if it's going to get dangerous if they're getting pushed back at such a rate and not someone's going to get injured here then blow the whistle but I, I think that com- the, the, at school's level they should be allowed to compete. We're all allowed to compete. Like, you know, um, like my generation, yeah, you could push into scrum. And was there many catastrophic injuries? No more so, I would say, you know, 20 years ago than there is now. So, and lads are struggling then when they hit yeah. adult. So. Yeah, I agree. Anyway, we had one more try to, to look at. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boring rugby yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> boring non-scrum <laughs> chat. <laughs> that old rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> I have to let the old uh, bikes have a go. Uh, go. Well, you don't really. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to give them the ball. <laughs> well, this is a case where one of the forwards uh, actually played like a back. Didn't Johnny Sexton mess up and miss touch just before this? He did. Yeah, yeah. That's where that um, kick was from. But. Uh, some good opportunism there from Jordy Murphy, actually. Yeah, he had a great. He, he had a very good game. All, all three of the back row were, were mm. like he carried a lot more. Um, Jordy Murphy probably because he was at six, mm. and it was his job. But uh, nice pass, mm. beautiful and pass, he, and he broke the tackle. Yeah. Bit of a handoff, and that's Dan Bigger, who's no slouch on the tackle either. Didn't mm. fumble because the ball was barely under control the whole time mm. as well. Um, but we, we've done that a few times this season so far it's got these lovely lines mm-hmm. that, that, that Murphy did it a couple of times against yeah. Glasgow mm-hmm. Van der Fleer did it there that's Van der is that Fleer type there. of an S type of line that they call it um, he's going straight then he kind of cuts in and straightens yeah. up again he just broke the tackle because of the mm-hmm. angle he hit yeah. he hit it up. I think if you've, got, if you've got somebody like Johnny Sexton and indeed Joey Carby before him mm-hmm. able to find Mm. Put the ball in in a space yes. where there's a hole, yeah. and somebody runs onto it. It's yeah. going to look good. Yeah. Watch it. Yeah. You didn't have to do much with the hand off in fairness. I remember mm. another flanker uh, handing off bigger, wasn't it? In the yeah, cup yeah. Match. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely <laughs> flattening him with a pneumatic oh, yeah. drill of a hand off, <laughs> John O'Brien. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. yeah, that's it for part one. Uh, please join us for part two.